the air with millions of people under a tornado watch as we speak, bracing for round two now as the South is just cleaning up from round one. Homes destroyed in Texas, triple digits, a rare and dangerous June heat wave. We're live ahead of an evening of extreme weather. We're also live in Pittsburgh with the gut-wrenching closing arguments in the trial of the shooter who carried out the deadliest anti-Semitic attack in American history. How his lawyers are trying to defend him as we take you inside court. Then in tonight's backstory, we go behind the scenes on our team's exclusive conversation with six women now suing Bill Cosby for sexual assault. Plus, we're learning more tonight about the two Americans found dead at a hotel in Mexico, the latest from the State Department. And we're going to break down how the White House and big ticket sellers are helping give you a reality check on the price you pay to do the things you love. Is it the end of junk fees? We're going to explain later on in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and we're coming on the air with breaking news in Texas and Oklahoma, or Tornado Watch happening right now, with some 20 million people facing dangerous storms. Round two is now on its way, with people barely cleaned up from round one overnight. Look at this. You can see some homes torn apart in Alabama, trees blocking roads in other parts of the state. Look at Louisiana, too, with these reported tornadoes left behind after 10 of them ripped through the south. Tons of rain, super strong wind, hail the size of toilet paper rolls in some spots. Now more than 70,000 people are left in the dark. No power for some 25,000 homes in Alabama. In Florida, something like 17,000, right around 10,000 in Georgia, Texas, and Mississippi. And if folks manage to avoid the storms, well, guess what? You may not be able to avoid the heat. We've got alerts tonight for a rare June heat wave in Louisiana, in Florida, and in Texas, where you can see the heat indexes. They're hitting well into the triple digits. It may even hit a record later on in the night in some of these spots. We have Sam Brock in Houston and meteorologist Bill Karens joining us. I want to get to Sam first. Obviously, it gets hot in Texas. Not this early, this badly, right? Talk us through what you're seeing and what people are getting ready for. Yes, truer words have never been spoken. Obviously, it is hot in Texas. Hallie, right now, it is either 99 or 100, depending upon which gauge you're looking at, with a heat index of about 112. Now, yes, that is absolutely true that you don't typically see this in mid-June. We haven't even officially hit the start of summer yet. Usually, it's July and August, where you have companies like ERCOT, which manages independently the electrical grid here, issuing weather watches in the city of Houston, where I am right now, rolling out its emergency heat plan. That would be about a month from now, but that's what's going on at this exact point in time as you see construction workers who are outside right now trying to get through this heat. Now, about four hours away from where I am in Cass County, Texas, Hallie, there's some 3,300 customers with no power because an EF2 tornado ripped through yesterday. The entire population of the county is 31,000. So a sizable chunk of people right now sweating it out in 100 degree temperatures with no electricity. As far as ERCOT is concerned, there have previously been some questions about the reliability of this network, not during heat waves like what we're seeing right now, but during snowstorms, fatally so in 2021. I just checked the grid. They have an app right here. And interestingly enough, it shows you the amount of available capacity. It's green and it shows 7,200 megawatts. That's a lot. At this time, a year ago, when we were out here pretty much in this exact same place, there was somewhere in the range of two to 3,000 megawatts available. So somehow the capacity has expanded. A lot of that, I believe, is wind and solar. I checked the details. About a third of all the energy right now that's being distributed throughout Texas is coming from renewables, not necessarily natural gas or coal. So that's an interesting revelation here in uh, natural resource rich Texas. Right. Th there's also now in other parts of Texas, different from where you are, the potential for tornado alerts. We're seeing that in Oklahoma, too, after those nearly a dozen reported tornadoes ripped through some other parts of the south, right? Let's talk about that. There was a tornado watch issued a little while ago for a stretch of North Texas and Oklahoma, which my understanding is has since expanded to include the Dallas area as well. But just that initial tornado watch, Holly, we're talking about some two and a half million people, 111 schools, or I should say 111 hospitals, thousands of schools as that line of storms gets on right through. Now, as far as other areas that have been impacted from Mississippi to Arkansas, we've seen hail, and you talked about this in your open, the size of two tennis balls together. It might have broken the Mississippi state record. Previously, it was five inches wide. This stuff was even more than five inches in diameter, crashing down on people's cars, basically blowing out the windows, basketball-sized dents in the hood. We're going to take a look at all these different video clips from wow. around the country coming up on Nightly News. But it is quite a portrait right now of severe weather throughout the South. You're looking at some of it right there.
Sure is. Sam Brock live for us there in Houston. Sam, thank you. Let me get to meteorologist Bill Karens. Where is the target zone tonight, Bill? Well, we're finishing the target zone in the southeast. We're just about done with all our really strong storms in the southeast. We've had some wind damage reports in Florida and also some large hail. And now we're going back out into the plains. Notice the white, the new thunderstorms and hail is being reported. And we could see these storms explode in the next couple hours. That's why we do have these tornado watches, huge ones, by the way, covering much of uh, western Oklahoma. And this brand new one that covers Dallas and Fort Worth, uh, just outside of Abilene and almost all the way down here to San Antonio. So. Again, isolated storms, but the storms that do form will get very strong, be able to produce. It was interesting, the Storm Prediction Center, Hallie, said DVD size hail. And I'm saying to myself, how many people even know what DV size, DVD size means anymore? But um, yeah, so that was one of the possibilities with these storms is the, is the huge, huge hail. I mean, it's enormous. We were talking about like five inches is the diameter of a toilet paper roll. You know what I mean? For people who don't use DVDs, you probably use TP. <laughs> so that stuff can be scary. That is why there is such a dangerous impact to this. Um, Bill Karens, I know you're going to be watching yes. everything. We'll be checking back in with you later on in the evening. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. To some other news now, a major cyber attack hitting several government agencies tonight. Here's how the country's top cybersecurity official is explaining it as we are getting new details. Listen. It's a software that federal agencies and companies across the world use. Right now, we're focused specifically on those federal agencies that may be impacted, and we're working hand in hand with them to be able to mitigate that risk. OK, so what happened, right? What did the hackers take? We are just learning in quite literally the last maybe six minutes or so that according to a senior official, um, no federal government data has been disclosed on so-called leak sites. So no government personal data has been leaked. They also think there's no systemic risk to national security. Obviously, it is a significant disruption and one that's coming as we have seen a lot of cyber attacks across this country. Look at this from hospitals to law enforcement to schools. Hackers at a private university in Virginia hijacked the school's emergency system not too long ago, for example. I want to bring in NBC's global security reporter Dan DeLuce for more. Dan, we are just getting this update now from a senior official talking us through the scope and the impact. What is the impact? They're saying that there is no sensitive intelligence information that's been stolen. So is that a sigh of relief for intel officials? Absolutely. Obviously? Yeah. And the military. Okay. Uh, they're also saying that it's a small number of federal agencies, whatever that means. But they said the Department of Energy appears to be one of them. Okay. They're saying there's no evidence yet that they're somehow conducting any ransomware. They haven't taken someone's data and tried to sort of ransom them about that. That's not happening. However, it still seems to be ongoing because they're trying to alert all the users to make sure they're aware mm. that this has happened. Meaning this software vulnerability hasn't yet been fixed? Like, in other words, this is a cyber attack that even tonight is still in process? In theory, yes. There's still could there still be some leaks. There could be leaks still. That's right. They're still trying to patch it up. Have they determined if there was any link to, for example, the Russian government? Because they're that ruling that up. They're, they saying, they're saying there doesn't seem to be any link to Russia at the Do moment. And that it seems it? to be, okay. an, sorry, a crime of opportunity. There doesn't seem to be some super... A uh, targeted effort to get at a specific type of type of data. Crime of opportunity by whom? In other words, who's hacking the government? It's a cyber criminal gang they call CLOP, and they've talked about them before, and they've done this kind of thing before, and dozens of organizations in the private sector have been hit by this. Explain that, right? Talk us through that, because we see again and again, and it, it's, in fact, I think so many that in some ways these cyber attacks are becoming noise unless you are part of the organization that got affected here. On the federal level, what are they doing to try to crack down on these kinds of things? What can you do? And there's so much technology out there and so much data out there. It's difficult. I think experts will tell you that it's sort of the new normal. It's, it's a barrage. There's so many attacks that fail that we don't even hear about. And so it's really about how fast can you patch it up? How fast can you stop the, the bleeding yeah. before you have some terrible hemorrhage? So Dan DeLuz, let me just make sure we understand from this this uh, reporting that you and our team are doing along with Andrea Mitchell in just the last couple of minutes here, potentially this cyber attack is still ongoing. They do not believe there is any threat to national security or to intelligence leaks. Um, and they believe that there is this sort of criminal gang behind it, not connected to the Russian government. Fair? That's it. All right, Dan DeLuce, walk it in with breaking news. We love to see it. Thank you very much for that. I appreciate it. We've got more developing news out of Pittsburgh, where the jury just in the last couple of minutes is being dismissed for the day after two and a half hours of deliberation in the trial of the Tree of Life synagogue shooter. They're going to pick up again tomorrow morning. And federal prosecutors want this message to stick with these jurors.
that that attacker did not enter that building five years ago to pray or worship. He came to kill. As they laid out graphic details from the deadliest attack on Jewish people in American history, prosecutors all but begging the jury to remember these 11 people, the names and faces of the people he killed, who can't be there to testify on their own behalf tonight. In gut-wrenching closing statements, laying out graphically what happened specifically on that Saturday in 2018, saying this shooter turned the synagogue into a hunting ground, reminding them of his anti-Semitic social media posts where he laid out in specific detail his intention to kill Jews and that he only stopped because he ran out of ammunition after shooting even at police who arrived on scene. Remember, he faces six, 63 federal charges, including 11 directly related to hate crimes. He's pleading not guilty in just the second federal death penalty case in the Biden administration. George Solis is live for us outside that federal courthouse in Pittsburgh. Tell us more, George. Yeah, Hallie, a very emotional day in court yet again. I spoke with members of the congregation who said all they can do is just try not to cry as they support one another as they have to relive this horror. As you can imagine, even five years later, they said no amount of time will pass where this doesn't resonate with them and with this community. And as you laid out, prosecution closing up today, much the way this, they started. They said this was obviously a shooter who went in there with the full intention of killing these people, of injuring and shooting at these officers, no doubt in their mind. This question for them was never about the guilt. They said this is pretty cut and dry. They said that he told officers that he went to the Tree of Life synagogue to kill Jews and that his hate runs deep. They profiled his his communications on social media, saying that he disseminated and spread a lot of rhetoric about how much he hated this community and that he went to the Tree of Life to carry out this heinous attack. And so again, no question for them that they wanted to prove that this man is guilty, and now they've left it up in the hands of the jury to decide whether or not that is the case, Hallie. Now, the attacker's attorneys are not denying that he killed 11 people at this synagogue. So how are they defending him? What defense are they putting forward? Yeah, so at this point, it's really more about raising questions about his intent and his motivation. During these closing arguments, what we really heard, which is interesting, is you didn't hear the defense say, look, we're going to try and dispel what the intent was here. This is obviously the facts are all here, but we do want to give you a little bit more characterization of who the shooter is, using things, and I'm going to quote here, about how his apartment was neat and tidy, how he slept on the mattress floor, and he had a fascination with computers and long guns, perhaps things that the jury didn't know about the accused shooter. But again, for them, this is not about trying to dispel whether or not he carried out this attack. They are saving their crucial defense for the sentencing portion of this, and that is whether or not he will get the death penalty, Hallie. After this, by the way, you talk about whether he gets the death penalty. This trial does not decide that. Depending on the verdict, there would have to be another trial, right, in order to determine whether he will be sentenced, put to death or not? That's exactly right. So we had here the so-called guilt phase. If we hear that the jury has reached a verdict in this, they will move to the sentencing phase, and that is where we're likely to see the defense raise questions about Bowers, the Q shooter's mental health during the course of this, and you might see uh, more witnesses come forward. But at this point, like I said, this is more so uh, about the guilt phase. If this moves to the sentencing, that is when this becomes about that crucial whether or not he gets the death penalty or life in prison, which I can tell you is also somewhat of a matter of debate here amongst members of the congregation. Some yeah. who say absolutely he deserves to be put to death. Others who say maybe it is best for him to spend the rest of his days in jail. But obviously, ultimately, it'll come down to the jury, Hallie. George Solis, thank you very much. To the Department of Justice now with one of golf's biggest tournaments teeing off today in L.A., the U.S. Open. We are learning tonight the DOJ is now investigating that controversial merger between the PGA Tour and Live Golf, according to a source briefed on the matter. They'd already been looking into whether the PGA broke antitrust rules for keeping players out of their tournaments if they joined Live. Julia Ainsley is joining us now. Um, tell us more, Julia. This is about anti-competition, basically, right? Yeah, it's about whether or not the PGA would have a global monopoly if it joined up with Live, that Saudi-backed golf league. And in the past, I mean, really, PGA has done a total 180 on this. In the past, PGA used to ban its golfers from coming back to the PGA, but Liv was offering them a ton of money. Phil Mickelson offered over $200 million, other people being offered the kind of money they just couldn't make in PGA, especially some of the lower-level golfers have 
Valley who said, look, if they weren't finishing in the top of the tournament, they couldn't make enough to stay in the game. Now it's kind of a, if you can't beat them, join them. They've gone the other way. And just last week, they announced that they would actually be teaming up and making a deal with Live Golf. But the Justice Department saying not so fast. We understand they're now reviewing that and that, according to The Wall Street Journal, PGA is saying in its own meetings, look, it could be over a year until they really get to the point where the yeah. specifics of the deal are wrapped up and that they actually could get any kind of approval. So a lot of roadblocks standing in the way of this pretty controversial merger, Hallie. Julia Ainsley, thank you so much. We've got some more breaking news coming into us just tonight, and that is a federal grand jury indicting that Air National Guardsman accused of leaking highly classified government secrets now facing six federal charges. We have just gotten our hands on this indictment. Jack Teixeira, 21 years old, now being charged with willfully retaining and releasing national defense information. Remember, he allegedly leaked some really sensitive information about Ukraine and U.S. allies on the online platform Discord. Remember, this is when he was taken into custody, those dramatic moments, chopper footage showing federal officials showing up at his house, again, taking him, and now we have this indictment. Ryan Riley has scrambled to a camera to join us now on this developing news. Ryan, fill us in. That's right. You know, there's some similarities, I think, actually, between this and, and the Donald Trump indictment, because, you know, I think in this case, we had an instance where this this young man was sort of showing off for the for the group chat. And I think that, you know, on Discord, and I think that that's sort of similar to what we saw in the Donald Trump uh, case, where there were, uh, you know, basically Donald Trump wanted to show off these documents and, and show off his access. Um, and that's sort of what is at the heart of all of this. So, you know, that's where sort of the shared motive, I think, that they both have there. But it's another instance in which DOJ is illustrating that they take these matters of classified documents very seriously. Um, this is, you know, obviously being handled a little bit differently. There's a different trajectory for this in terms of, you know, pretrial uh, de uh, uh, detention um, for this individual. Um, it's just on a little bit of a different a different track, even though, you know, this guy was a pretty young guy with not a lot of power as compared to Donald Trump, uh, the former uh, president, um, who, of course, um, hoarded a lot more documents than um, the, are charged, at least in this uh, instance uh, of this sharing on Discord here, Haley. What are the consequences that he faces now related to these charges, Ryan? In other words, what could happen to him? There, I mean, there are very serious charges, you know, that, that, you know, if you went to trial, it could potentially get very high up in um, the years uh, if they go a different way. You know, we saw, I think Reality Winter is probably the closest we could uh, yeah. point to of how that sort of went. Of course, there's a little bit of a different motivation there where Reality Winter thought she was getting this out uh, to help the country, to tell them about Russian interference um, in the in the presidential election, uh, whereas this guy was just sort of, you know, trying to show off for his, his online friends. Um, but, you know, five years is end, it was what a reality winter ended up with. And I think that's a reasonable expectation, depending on how, of course, this case plays out. Obviously, when you plead guilty, there's a much different trajectory uh, than if you take these cases to trial, yeah. in which case a trial penalty sort of applies. One of the things that was, I think, fascinating people about this, in addition to just the national security information that apparently got out there, um, is there's been a sort of trove of documents and information that we've seen, has been the details of how Teixeira allegedly got this information out. I have been on the air and haven't had a chance to read through the indictment yet. Are we learning anything more from it? Are we getting a, more of a glimpse into the way that this allegedly happened? You know, I think actually the original criminal complaint gave us maybe a little bit more information about than the actual indictment does. But the indictment is obviously a very important step because now it's cleared that uh, that hurdle of being presented before, you know, a couple dozen uh, fellow Americans who said that this cleared, uh, you know, the evidentiary standard to move forward uh, to trial. Um, that's something that Donald Trump, of course, also was afforded uh, as someone of Americans looking at this independently and voting and saying that there's enough um, evidence to at least move to a trial there. Um, so I think that, you know, it's a different it's basically the next step in this in this process as this case uh, continues. Um, but we could see it potentially on a faster track, you know, when you consider um, the pretrial detention that we're talking about um, in this instance and the threat to national security. Ryan Riley, thank you for getting in front of a camera and for bringing us that developing news tonight on Jack Teixeira. Really appreciate it. It is clearly a very busy evening because also just coming into us, news on the health front. This panel of FDA advisors voting unanimously to update the next round of COVID boosters for the fall. So it's the next step for your fall booster shot. They're trying to target the biggest strain of the virus that's going around. Right now, it's an Omicron subvariant called XBB. They want new vaccines to give you longer protection from the virus. And the timing is important here. You might think, well, it's only June. Why are we talking about false shots? Because Pfizer and companies like that need 
uh, need to know sort of what they need to make, basically. They need the time to actually create these shots. Dr. John Torres is joining us now. So what does this mean for all the rest of us, right? If we're going to go out and get a booster, you know, if we need one, et cetera. And Hallie, you're exactly right. The reason they made this decision today is because they need to give the manufacturers time to ramp up, and it takes a few months. Manufacturers are saying mid to late summer they should start getting the vaccines out there. And so we'll find out when we're going to get them. But essentially what this means to us is we know they are now going to make this booster shot with just this XBB variant. Like you mentioned, it's 40 percent for one of them, the 1.5, but there's other variants as well. They're bringing up to 70, 80 percent of all the cases out there because of XBB. And so they want to make sure we're protected against that by using an XBB variant. They did not decide which variant to use since there are a variety of them, and they're going to leave that up to the FDA to decide once they get this recommendation from the advisory committee. And then as far as what's going to happen from there, CDC is going to meet next week, and they're going to decide, okay, who gets what and when and how they're going to do all that, Hallie. Dr. John Torres, thank you very much. To an you NBC bet. News exclusive now. Developing overseas are Richard Engel one on one with Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky, giving his honest take on Republicans like former President Donald Trump and Florida Governor Ron DeSantis running for the White House, who are skeptical about giving more aid, more help, more money and uh, offensive capabilities to Ukraine. Both Richard and the president talking about Zelensky's pleas for F-16s, the potential threat to a key nuclear power plant, with Zelensky calling Russia's Wagner mercenary fighters killers as Ukraine launches a new counteroffensive. Here's Zelensky's response to candidates who don't want to help this country, he says. Is any candidate or senator who thinks it costs too much for the United States to support Ukraine, is he ready to go to war, to fight, to send his kids? Are they ready to die? Richard Engel has more from Kiev. Here in Kiev today, I sat down with Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky. It was his first interview since Ukraine went on the offensive, launched a counter-offensive. Since the start of this war, which has been going on for nearly 500 days, Ukraine has been fighting, largely successfully, to defend itself, to defend the capital, to defend the cities, to push back Russian invaders. Now, Ukraine is changing that dynamic. It is trying to break through Russian front lines. Russian troops still occupy about 20 percent of this country. And now that Ukraine has more weapons, more weapons systems, more air defense systems that have come in and more are coming in, Ukraine is trying to push those Russians off Ukrainian territory. But going on the offensive is much more difficult than defending your home, defending your land. And although it's still early days, President Zelensky acknowledged that so far it is proving to be a very tough slog. I cannot give you all the details. There are both defensive and offensive actions. Things look not bad. I would say it's generally positive, but it's difficult. Zelensky is also telling Richard he's concerned that Russia's next target could be the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, with the goal trying to pressure Ukraine to get back to the negotiating table on terms favorable to Moscow. Our thanks to Richard Engel for that reporting, as there is plenty to watch in the days to come. You can catch more on NBC Nightly News, 6.30 Eastern, wherever you watch your local NBC station. A lot more to get to on a busy night here on the show. We're talking about the extreme wind and the huge cyclone making landfall in India and Pakistan today, why where it's hitting is so devastating. Plus, the Supreme Court giving a big win to native tribes in a decision all about adoption. We're getting into it next. Why one country's inflation problem is getting blamed on Beyonce, coming up in our five things. But first, a huge victory tonight for the rights of Native American tribes as the Supreme Court is rejecting a challenge to federal law that looks to keep Native families together. It's called the Indian Child Welfare Act. It was passed 45 years ago. Its goal was to keep Native kids inside tribes in adoption, custody, and foster care cases, designed to correct centuries of racism against Native Americans. Three states and a white couple sued the government, saying that that law, that act, illegally gave preference to Native families. But in a 7-2 to vote, the justices say that those challengers basically aren't allowed to sue here. And Justice Amy Coney Barrett, writing for the majority, says Congress is allowed to make laws to keep Native kids together. President Biden 
celebrating the move among the advocates who are, saying that the decisions, in his words, keep in place a vital protection for tribal sovereignty and Native children. Lawrence Hurley joins me now. And this is very significant news. Mm -hmm. Lawrence, explain why. Well, this is a huge win for the tribes because it kind of really reaffirms this protection that they have that you alluded to, which is, you know, the centuries of efforts uh, by the federal government and state governments to take away kids from Native American families in an effort to assimilate them, take them away from the tribe, make them speak English, cut their hair, you know, just distance them from all their traditions. And this was something that Justice Neil Gorsuch really got into in his uh, concurring opinion today, where he was like a kind of history lesson, you know, talking about all these bad things that happened in the past and why it was important for Congress to pass this law and that that overcame some of these concerns that people have that were brought up in these challenges. It is also this decision by the court a kind of surprising one to court experts, given that the court has a conservative majority. I think there are those who thought this would go a different way. Yeah, for sure. I mean, even coming out of the oral argument back in November, it really seemed like the court was going to take at least a chunk out of this law. And instead, they turned away all these challenges. They didn't actually rule on the merits in all of these cases, all of these issues, right? So this case could still come back on this challenge as to whether these preferences that the law has are racist because they... Uh, give Native American tribes preferences over non-Native Americans. So, significant ruling today. It is sort of early to mid-June. We know this is crunch time for the Supreme Court. We still have some big cases, big decisions out there on affirmative action, for example, student debt, that's a big one, student loans, LGBTQ plus rights. Talk to us about what we should anticipate and what you're looking for in the next, let's say, three weeks. Yes, yeah, so there's 20 rulings left, and they're all going to come in the next two weeks. Right. Uh, so, yeah, affirmative action is a huge one. You know, what the court did today in turning away this kind of race challenge to the Native American law and what they did last week when they upheld the key part of the Voting Rights Act um, doesn't really tell us anything about what they might do in those yeah, cases. Yeah. Affirmative action, this is a real conservative issue. They've been gunning for that for a long time. So we can't really draw any lessons from these previous cases um, the conservative court is still a conservative court, and we're probably going to get some conservative rulings. Lawrence Hurley, thank you so much. I'm sure we'll be talking again sometime in the next couple of weeks. Appreciate yeah. it. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, huge cyclone hitting land in India and Pakistan today. A lot of rain, flash flooding, a lot of wind. Tens of thousands of people have already been forced to evacuate. You can see the waves there. It's supposed to hit the same area that had all that historic flooding last summer, which killed nearly 2,000 people and forced millions of others from their homes. Number two, the suspect in last year's mass shooting at a gay nightclub in Colorado is expected to take a plea deal, according to survivors. It means he will probably spend his life in prison on state murder and hate crime charges for the attack that killed five people and hurt 17. Number three, former UFC champ Conor McGregor is denying allegations he sexually assaulted a woman at game four of the NBA Finals last week. The woman's attorney said McGregor trapped his client in a bathroom at the Miami Heat's arena. The Heat organization and the UFC both said they're looking into it. Number four, first public appearance for Pope Francis now since he had surgery to fix a hernia last week. There he is visiting a children's wing at the hospital where he's recovering. The Vatican says he will be discharged from the hospital tomorrow morning. Number five, who do you blame for Sweden's inflation problem? Apparently Beyonce, according to one economics expert. Remember we told you about fans flying all over the world to actually save money on ticket prices for her show? Well, her Renaissance World Tour kickoff in Stockholm brought in a ton of people. And this expert says a surge in things like hotel prices came with it, which added to the country's inflation. Time now to get the backstory, our behind the scenes look at how a story comes together and how it fits into our big picture. And tonight, a spokesperson for Bill Cosby is reacting to a new sexual assault lawsuit being filed against him in Nevada, saying the women suing him are motivated by, and I'm quoting here, their addiction to massive amounts of media attention and greed. His attorney, Andrew Wyatt, went on to say, from this day forward, we will not continue to allow these women to parade various accounts against Mr. Cosby anymore without vetting them in the court of public opinion and inside court. This comes after NBC's Kate Snow sat down with six of the women behind the lawsuit for an exclusive conversation you will only see on NBC. Listen. Why are you filing suit? To take back my power. It's time for him to be responsible for his actions. Culpability. Justice. It's never, ever too late to take our lives back and to get the justice every single one of us deserves. And we're living proof of that. 
These women, along with three others, say Cosby used what they describe as his enormous power, fame, and prestige to isolate and assault them. Back in the late 70s to early 90s, Cosby has consistently denied all allegations of sexual abuse. He has no criminal convictions related to them. You'll remember, a Pennsylvania Supreme Court threw out a 2018 conviction on assault a couple years ago. You're looking at some images here. This is a story that Kate knows well. She's been covering it for years. There she is speaking to some of these accusers, often exclusively to the women behind these accusations. I want to bring in Kate now. Um, Kate, thank you so much for being with us today. It is not easy uh, to, I assume, get in front of a camera and talk about these kinds of things. Um, and yet, many women in many instances have done it with you here. Mm. I think back to one example back in 2018. You spoke with Andrea Konstat. She had said no to every interview request for 13 years and then agreed to one with you. Talk us through what it means to be sort of the tip of the spear on reporting a story like this and how you obtain these interviews. Um, yeah, Hallie, I mean, it goes back years, right? It actually goes yeah. back to the very initial, you know, the early days when we started to hear stories about Bill Cosby and women were coming forward in the press. Um, that summer of 2015, I sat down with 27 women who had come forward with accusations at that point that's against right. Bill Cosby. Um, that's actually not the video you're looking at, but it was a giant, a room, one. F yep. giant yep. room full of people. 27 women, which I've never done such a large interview before, by the way. And that was put together not just by me, but a team of Dateline producers. Um, and, and I had to build trust with them. You know, I had to, I, I started out that, we, we sat for more than two, three hours, I think, in that interview. Um, again, every one of those women that you're seeing there has made ac accusations against Bill Cosby. Um, and so I started out by trying to tell them who I was and what I've been through in my life and how I could um, hear them and listen to them and let them tell their stories. And so from there, you know, it built a, it built a trust with some of those women, yeah. and I've kept in touch with them. They text me. I text them sometimes when news develops. It's not to say that I'm not still a reporter. I very much am still a reporter. I reach out to Andrew Wyatt, Cosby's spokesperson, who you sure. just quoted. Um, we reach out through NBC every time we do one of these stories, and we should note that Cosby at the moment is not convicted of any right. criminal uh, charge because his criminal conviction was overturned, as you mentioned. Um, but yeah, I think I think there's something to building relationships when you're a reporter. Once people know that they can talk to you and trust you to tell their story, the, you know, with just the facts, then they come back to you and, and with, I think, compassion for what, what they allege that they've been through. There's also been such an evolution in the Cosby sort of story from a yeah. news perspective over the course of, Kate, almost the last 10 years, I think, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, it's been a long time. It's been a long time. It's actually the early 2000s, if you think about when Andrea Constant yeah. first voiced some of what, you know, or not really publicly voiced, but but made a complaint. Um, that was the early 2000s. Yeah, so it's been a while. And, and, and these women have gone from, you know, even before the Me Too movement, starting to tell their stories, starting to do group interviews, and then watching Andrea, who you're seeing there, take a criminal case to court, once and and there was a hung jury and then the second time there was conviction mm -hmm. and then it was overturned and I interviewed them when that all happened and they felt uh, many of them said that they felt that justice had been undone um, and they they a lot of them lost some hope but then they fought and where we're at today is that they fought for changes to state laws Hallie which is what enabled these women in Nevada mm -hmm. the, the nine women and six of whom I talked to last night they were able to come forward with this new suit because the statute was changed in part because they lobbied for the statute to be changed in Nevada. It's also been changed in California, in New York, in other places where Cosby is now facing um, civil litigation. In one case in L.A., he was found civilly liable, by the way. Uh, but Cosby does continue to maintain his innocence and say that he denies every allegation of abuse. Kate Snow, it is incredible reporting again. Um, thank you so much for helping to pull back the curtain a little bit and sure. show us how this comes together and give our audience a look at that. Thank you. Thank you. We should note, of course, you can see Kate not just on Nightly News, but also from 2 to 4 Eastern on NBC News Daily. You can follow her online at, at TV Kate Snow. Our thanks to her for that. Up next, some experts say all that smoke we saw in the air last week, remember that, could be a warning sign of what's to come. A closer look at our new climate reality in The Breakdown coming up in just a minute.
you're about to be looking live at Dubuque, Iowa, where there is like a hazy smoke in the air. Check this out. You see it right here. A live look at that air quality outside. Unhealthy to be out for anybody. And yes, if it is deja vu, it's because it is. This is the smoke from those Canadian wildfires again, except in the Midwest. You remember how bad it was last week on the East Coast? Unlike a lot of us have ever seen before. So are these rare climate events something we should get used to? Here's the breakdown. The most recent climate emergency catching New York City off guard. There's no blueprint or playbook for these type of issues. Tons of smoke turning the sky a hazy orange. The air quality more dangerous than it's ever been in New York, forcing people indoors and back in masks outside. So why did it get so bad? Start at the source. Those Canadian wildfires, hundreds of them, fueled by an unusually dry and hot season. Year after year, with climate change, we're seeing more and more intense wildfires and in places where they don't normally happen. Some climate experts say this smoky scene is a kind of warning sign about unexpected disasters driven by the climate crisis, putting millions at risk. Politicians and emergency planners now have to adapt to our rapidly changing climate. The wildfire smoke on the East Coast was a perfect example of that last week. The White House climate advisor, Ali Zaidi, tells us climate change affects everyone differently, but the bottom line is the same for all of us. If we do not get after the greenhouse gas emissions that drive this problem in the first place, it's going to get worse for everybody, no matter how bad it is right now. This is, unfortunately, the new normal. Natural disasters forced some 3 million Americans to leave their homes last year and cost the country more than $175 billion. This year alone, the West has seen a parade of storms dumping record-setting snow in the California mountains and flooding neighborhoods, usually dealing with drought. Down south, tornado alleys shifting east, with deadlier supercell storms happening more often in states like Alabama, Mississippi, and Tennessee. Our whole community is gone. And Puerto Rico just dealt with a record-breaking heat wave with a dangerous heat index of 125 degrees at its peak. When you have a weather pattern setting up in the same areas day after day, you can get these extremes with drought, with fires, with rainfall. And that's one of the biggest things that climate scientists are studying. All of it illustrating how previously rare extreme weather events are happening more often in more places. In this new climate reality, Zadie suggests staying on offense may be the best defense. Everybody has to be in the business of being prepared. It can't just be in these moments of shock when the sky turns orange when we care. We've got to care every single other day of the year. We are also just learning in just the last hour that New York's governor is warning those smoky skies from the Canadian fires could be coming back to the state tomorrow. So New Yorkers, East Coast friends, be warned. We've also got some breaking news just into us from Colorado. Two men have been shot in Denver after the Nuggets NBA championship parade, according to police. They say this shooting was targeted and that these victims have been brought to the hospital. I want you to take a look at some of the video here that we're just getting in. A police officer apparently run over during some of the chaos. This is after 10 people were hurt in a shooting earlier this week after the Nuggets actually won the championship. We're going to stay on top of this story and bring you any developments as we get them. Coming up here on the show, two Americans found dead in their hotel room in Mexico. What we're now learning about these mysterious deaths, who the victims were, and what police think happened. Next. The State Department tonight confirming the deaths of two Americans at a resort in Mexico's Baja California Peninsula and the suspected cause, apparently, inhaling gas. This happened in a seaside community called El Pescadero. You can see it here, just north of Cabo. Paramedics were responding to a call that two people were found unconscious in their hotel room. By the time they arrived, the two were already dead. Mexican authorities say the cause of death was intoxication by substance to be determined. Here's the State Department spokesperson. We are closely monitoring the investigation into the cause of, the, of death, uh, and we stand ready to provide any consular, uh, uh, any appropriate consular assistance. Dana Griffin is joining us now live from L.A. So, Dana, we are hearing now from the family of Abby Lutz. Tell us more about what they're saying and what else we know about what happened. People have said, you know, point of the finger, gas inhalation. Does that mean carbon monoxide? 
It could be. We are still waiting for toxicology results to confirm exactly what substance, but according to the family, and they even wrote this on their GoFundMe page, they say that they have been told it was due to improper venting of the resort and could be carbon monoxide poisoning. That's, I guess, information that they're getting from officials. Right now, the State Department is not further commenting because of privacy concerns, but they tell us that their loved one, Abby Lutz, the 28-year-old who was there with her 41-year-old boyfriend, John Heathco, were, you know, enjoying a, a great time in Mexico. This was a luxury upscale resort, a place that they felt safe. It was nice, very comfortable. They say they got there on Saturday and they started feeling ill. They actually went to the hospital Sunday night, spent the night, had to get IVs because they thought they had food poisoning. They started feeling better, and on Monday, they went back. They actually enjoyed time at the pool, text their family that they were going to bed, and that was the last time the family heard from them. We spoke to not only the stepdaughter, but um, excuse me, Abby's stepsister and stepmother. Here's what they had to say. She thought it was food poisoning for sure. Um, they had gone to dinner and had some steak and some guacamole and some chips, and they just thought it was food poisoning. They had no idea. None of us thought about that, you know, because you can't smell carbon monoxide. Again, that's where the whole carbon monoxide poisoning comes from. Officials are still waiting to confirm if that was, in fact, the the gas inhalation substance that may have killed them. But, Hallie, this isn't the first time Americans have been found dead at resorts or other Mexican um our hotels that have been connected to suspected uh, carbon monoxide poisoning. Actually, in October, three Americans were found dead at a, a, a rented apartment, and the substance there was some sort of gas, some sort of uh, carbon monoxide. And then in 2018, a gas leak caused by a water heater killed two parents and their young kids again, suspected of carbon monoxide poisoning. So this is obviously painting a picture of, of concern for people who like to travel because these are places that a lot of people would find comfortable and should be up to scale. But we've been told that in some cases in Mexico, proper gas line installation, vents and monitoring devices are often lacking. So it's definitely a warning to other people that are planning to travel to the country to be safe and make sure you're checking your rooms so that Something like this, unfortunately, doesn't happen to anyone else. Hallie? Dana Griffin, live for us on this story. Dana, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Got a lot more to come here on the show, including more on what the White House is doing to try to make going to concerts, if not easier on your wallet, at least easier on your mental state as you buy those tickets. We're talking about junk fees and where those land. Coming up. We are back with a new update overseas out of Greece, where rescuers have been looking for survivors after a boat carrying migrants sank in the Mediterranean Sea, killing dozens of people. 104 so far have been rescued. At least 79 are dead, but that total may be way higher. I want to bring in NBC's Matt Bradley for more. And this is just devastating. Matt, talk us through. Yeah, Hallie, and the most devastating part of this is that those 104 survivors have been telling rescue workers that actually there were as many as 100 children who were below in the hold in that ship, those children still unaccounted for. But, uh, you know, again, there's something like 750 people on this boat. A hundred have survived. Only 75 bodies have been found. So, Hallie, we're still talking about hundreds and hundreds of more people who are unaccounted for. Many of them are going to be women and children. But already we're hearing about recriminations and investigations. Greek authorities have arrested nine people who they accuse of being the masterminds behind this illegal voyage that killed so many people. They're thought of as people smugglers. And now they're going to be facing, in Greece, the force of the law. Hallie? Matt Bradley, thank you for that update. NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day. And because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. Out of our Northeast Bureau, the man from Vermont accused of murdering his mom at sea has died. 
Officials said today the 29-year-old who was charged with killing his mom on a fishing trip off the New England coast in 2016. Prosecutors say he wanted to inherit millions of dollars. He pleaded not guilty to first-degree murder. The trial had been supposed to start in the fall. Out of our Southern Bureau today, two Democrats who were kicked out of the Tennessee State House for protesting gun laws are on the ballot. Justin Jones in Nashville, Justin Pearson in Memphis. Today is the special primary election day. General election day is in August. And a video game come to life, perhaps? Universal says it's building a Last of Us-themed haunted house based on that very popular video game and now very popular HBO series, thanks in part to the guy you just saw. It'll be part of the Universal Studios Halloween Horror Nights. Universal, of course, is a subsidiary of Comcast who also owns us at NBC. Tonight, a pretty big development over at the White House if you like buying tickets or renting off of, let's say, Airbnb. Those so-called hidden fees, right? Junk fees, they call them. We've been talking a lot about on everything from concert tickets to hotel rooms. They can raise ticket prices by something like 70%. Well, listen, it may be the end of them. Maybe. It could go away on some sites like Ticketmaster maybe soon. The president's meeting with companies like Live Nation, SeatGeek, Airbnb in just the last few hours. He says they're all going to ditch those hidden charges, make it more transparent. Listen. The, the solution is what it's called all-in pricing. And uh, that's where companies fully disclose their fees up front when you start shopping, so you're not surprised at the end when you check out. NBC's Noah Pransky is posted up at the big board to break it all down for us. I think we're all familiar with that sort of surprise when you get to the checkout cart and you're like, oh my God, this is twice as much as I thought it was paying. It's not like tickets or rentals are getting cheaper, Noah. Let's be clear. It's that there's more transparency. You're going to know right away what kind of cost you're looking at, right? Yeah, that's a big step. And, you know, you don't have to go shopping for Taylor Swift tickets to know that those fees can really add up. But Hey, let's go shopping for some Taylor Swift tickets while we're at it. Looking at a show in Denver next week, uh, next month, $2,000 for a ticket, but 462 of that are the fees that get added in. So we talk about sticker shock. If you don't see that up front, yeah, you're going to be surprised. The old way of getting tickets, you would go online, select a teaser price, and then just close your eyes and pray and hope that the final price wasn't so much higher. But the new way, these companies are voluntarily signing on, according to the Biden administration, to put the total cost up front. That will allow you to comparison shop. So it's not just the sticker shock. It's that you'll actually be able to be a better consumer when you can see what the price is right up front. The gold standard here, airlines, because of an Obama era rule that forces them to show you the final price up front. We don't have that in other industries. So airline tickets, you see a price, you comparison shop, you can get the best price. And what you saw advertised is the price you pay. We also want to talk Airbnb because we did mention them. This past winter, they have been facing some pressure on their fees, and they included a brand new, new total price display tool. You can toggle it on, and while it isn't perfect because there's still taxes added in after that, it's a step in the right direction. The Biden administration says they are just beginning. We want to see progress, but they still want to get legislation to combat these fees once and for all. What's interesting about this one, and I'm here in Washington, so of course I look at this through a bit of a political lens, Everybody likes it, right? There's rare bipartisan support to take this kind of thing on. You know, he mentioned in the State of the Union, he wants to get this done. There yeah. is support in Congress. And as long as you don't tell the public that it's a Biden initiative, it pulls really, really well. 84% of Democrats mm. say they like what's in his proposals, 81% of Republicans. So the Biden administration is actually facing resistance from really industry forces and lobbyists, not so much from the politicians. So instead, they're going for an incremental approach. Approach. They're trying enforcement with DOJ, FTC. They're issuing hundreds of millions of dollars in fines to kind of scare industries into being better toward consumers. They're working with states on passing state-level laws that could have a ripple effect, like California may pass basically a, a requirement to be transparent. That would change how all of us buy our tickets, our hotel rooms, our rental cars across the country. And then rulemaking, the FTC likely to unveil something maybe early next year that would require transparency. So the price you see advertised is the price you get. That's Hallie. right. That's right. And I think we can't say it enough, Noah, right? And I just want to be super crystal clear here in the 20 seconds we have left. It's not necessarily going to make it cheaper for you to get your Taylor Swift tickets. You will just know more clearly uh, how much of a bite it's going to take out of your budget. Yeah, that's right? a big deal. That right? We're yeah. starting to see it already on some sites. And when you have really? transparency, you can see better comparisons. It makes you a better consumer.
Noah Pransky, thank you for that breakdown. I think that's, uh, as they say, news you can use. Appreciate it. That does it for us this hour. We have a lot more coverage of a busy night coming up right now. Coming on the air with new tornado warnings we're learning about in just the last couple of minutes with millions of people bracing for round two. The South only just cleaning up from this in round one. Homes destroyed, triple digit heat in Texas, a rare and dangerous June heat wave. We're live ahead of an evening of extreme weather. Also tonight, more on that breaking news we brought you in the last hour. The alleged leaker of a ton of sensitive national security information on Discord now facing six federal charges. We're combing through this new indictment. We'll tell you what it tells us us in a minute. Plus, even more breaking news, a new denial tonight from former UFC champion Conor McGregor as he's accused of sexually assaulting a woman at the NBA Finals. But his lawyers are telling our team tonight. Plus, with the gut-wrenching closing arguments in the trial of the shooter who carried out the deadliest anti-Semitic attack in American history, how his lawyers are trying to defend him. We'll take you inside Pittsburgh court. And new tonight, why the Justice Department is investigating that controversial merger between the PGA Tour and Saudi-backed Live Golf right as the U.S. Open tees off. We'll have that later on in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie. We're coming on the air with breaking news. Parts of Oklahoma under an active tornado warning right now with some 20 million people in all facing dangerous storms. This is round two on its way with people, look at this, barely cleaned up from round one. Some homes torn apart in Alabama. You're seeing Louisiana, two trees blocking roads. This is all of what these reported tornadoes left behind. Ten of them, at least, ripping through the south. A lot of rain, a lot of wind. Hail the size of toilet paper rolls in some spots. Five inches. Now, more than 70,000 people are left in the dark. No power for like 26, 25,000 people in Alabama and Florida, 17,000. Just about 10,000 in Georgia, Texas, and Mississippi. And if people manage to avoid the storms, they may not be able to avoid the heat. We've got alerts tonight for this rare June heat wave in Louisiana, in Florida, and in Texas, where you can see the heat indexes are hitting well into the triple digits here. It may even get to a record later on tonight there. We have Sam Brock live for us in Houston, but I want to start with meteorologist Bill Karens now, because Bill, this active tornado warning, where is it? What are you seeing? The evening is in areas of central Oklahoma. This is Lawton. This is right on Interstate 44, and there is a tornado warning with this storm. This is what we call a classic supercell thunderstorm. This is capable of producing baseball-sized hail. An isolated tornado is possible. Right now, it has not been spotted. There are storm spotters out here watching this closely. The storm is spinning, but it's not producing a tornado yet. It can at any time. And now we're going to start to see new storms popping up. Oklahoma City right here, new storms just popping up to your south. And these will quickly grow and get much stronger in the next couple hours. Let's go in a little bit closer here. And you can see the Lawton area here. This is where the tornado would be if it's on the map here. And it's heading towards the east, probably just south of Marlow, where you see this dark purple. This is where the large hail's like likely fallen all the way back in the Lawton to maybe even, you know, significant damage possible with a large hail there. So we'll keep an eye on that. As far as the severe weather reports go, this is the storm we were just watching. See all these little white things? Those are all large hail reports with that storm. So we know if you're in the path of that, you want to get your vehicle out of the way. And also we're watching new storms popping up in Texas. So the area of greatest concern is where we have that one storm right now and then new storms will be forming south of here and heading towards Oklahoma City, Wichita Falls and Dallas as we go throughout the rest of this evening. Along with the large hail, isolated tornadoes, these winds could be very strong, up to 75 to 80 mile per hour winds. So expect a lot of high power outage numbers as we go throughout the evening. As far as the watches go, these tornado watches will go till about 10 o'clock local time. It includes Oklahoma City, Wichita Falls, the Dallas-Fort Worth area, Waco, and up to the north here, more of a, just a wind damage threat in areas of Kansas. As far as the heat goes, it's not that these are record numbers, Hallie, as far as temperatures. It is so humid. I mean, it is one of the grossest, most humid days we've seen throughout this region. Dallas, something called the dew point. It's how we measure the amount of moisture in the air. Tied their all-time record with a dew point of 80 today. So that's just gross. That's sticky. That's you walk outside and you start sweating immediately. Ugh. And so, yeah, they would. this is like, it's air, it's air conditioning or sweating. There's no in between. Bill Karens, uh, thank you very much. Appreciate you staying on top of all of that. Let me get to Sam Brock, who's live for us in Texas. Texas had some of these um, tornado warnings, if we will, as we stick with the storm, Sam, earlier, along with parts of Oklahoma, as Bill just went over. 
bracing for yet more extreme weather tonight. That's the big concern. Yeah, so North Texas was under a tornado watch. That's exactly right, Allie. And, and Bill mentioned a second ago that these storms are capable of producing baseball-sized hail. Well, apparently they have, because NWS, the National Weather Service in Norman, just tweeted this out. Destructive baseball-sized hail continues through Lawton right now, also adding that there are strong 80-mile-per-hour plus winds going on. Just as a general frame of reference, that means it's tropical storm force winds ripping through that part of Oklahoma at this moment. And we've already seen the level of damage that that can do in terms of homes being absolutely wrecked, trees uprooted, power lines down. You talked about this at the top of your segment, that in Texas right now there's 10,000 plus customers without power. Most of them are in Cass County, which is about four and a half hours away on the border of Arkansas. As you see these powerful images on your screen right now, just think about the population of 31,000 people in that community, in that county, that has no air conditioning. Bill said, you know, it's either sweating or air conditioning. Sometimes you have air conditioning and you're still sweating. It is right. soupy out here. You step out, you feel the humidity on your Ugh. skin. So I cannot imagine, especially for older Americans, what it would be like right now to not have air conditioning. When is there going to be any relief from the uh, intense and, frankly, wet heat that you're talking about, Sam? Because there's a reason you're standing in front of, I assume, um, what's behind you there. The concerns about the AC, the power grid, this comes up in Texas when it gets like this. Yes, there have been concerns for the power grid here notoriously ever since, you know, 2021, really 2011 for Texas with snowstorms. But in 2021, another snowstorm came through and knocked out basically or had disruptive power rolling blackouts for weeks. And so, yes, there's a lot of attention right now on the infrastructure behind me also because you have all of these natural gas and coal plants that are supposed to have lifelines, Hallie, of 30 to 50 years. And some of them, a high percentage, have already met that timeline or exceeded it. So there's deep concerns about what might happen if something is knocked offline. Now, the good news on this is that despite the fact that ERCOT, which manages this grid, says we might be seeing a record level of usage in the next 10 days, that's the time frame right now for this heat wave, they broke records 11 times last year, and not a single time did they fail to deliver power reliably to customers. So if you're using that as a benchmark, that is good news. But there's still worry right now, especially in a state like Texas, which has gained more people than any other state in the U.S. in recent years, a half a million people last year since 2000, some 9 million residents, up to 30 million. And yes, the, the projections for how much energy is going to be used, it's not taking into account the fact that the population has surged here. So all of those factors right now, but again, I just checked the ERCOT app. They have 7,000 megawatts of available energy right now. I got to tell you, that might not mean much to people listening at home. That's no, a big number. So right now, okay. things are running smoothly. All right. Uh, I believe you, Sam. Thank you for the context. Thank you for being out there. Thank you for making sure that you and your team are staying safe and for bringing us the latest. I so appreciate it. We're going to have a look at how these extreme weather events that we're seeing are happening more often and in more places coming up later in the show. But we want to get to some breaking news now. A federal grand jury indicting the Air National Guardsmen accused of leaking highly classified government secrets now facing six federal charges. We have just gotten this indictment in only the last hour. It says 21-year-old Jack Teixeira, remember him? Accused of leaking all this stuff on Discord. He's being charged with willfully retaining and releasing national defense information. This was stuff about Ukraine, allegedly about U.S. allies. This is the video when he was taken into custody. Very memorable. You had those choppers overhead as the feds went in and got him, essentially. The FBI director, Chris Wray, we're just hearing from him in a statement, saying that people like Teixeira, who were given security clearance, are trusted to protect our classified information and to safeguard our nation's secrets, saying the allegations in this indictment reveal a serious violation of that trust. Ryan Riley joins us now. A serious violation of trust. Tell us more about this new indictment and the charges Teixeira faces. Yeah, what's interesting to me about that that Ray statement is, you know, you could just as well apply that to the Donald Trump um, indictment. It doesn't actually have any specificity as regards to the individual defendants. It applies to him as well. Donald Trump was someone who was uh, entrusted with the, those uh, national uh, security uh, secrets. Um, and you see, you know, the video that's playing on your screen right now, how seriously federal prosecutors uh, tip and the federal government and the FBI typically treat uh, the handling of classified um, information. It's, you know, it's big level stuff. This is stuff that people go through a process to get uh, cleared for. And I think the biggest factor right now that shows you how seriously they typically handle these cases is that this individual is detained right now. He's behind bars. Um, he's being held in pretrial detention. Um, and this is not someone who's out on the campaign trail. Uh, this is someone who is is being held because of the seriousness uh, of this, uh, of these allegations and these six charges. Is that unusual, Ryan, for an instance like this? 
I mean, Reality Winter, we also saw she was locked up uh, pre-trial. She was held for a long time and was sentenced to five years uh, behind bars. And, you know, he'll eventually, if it gets to this point, of course, if he's found guilty, uh, will get credit for the time he's served behind bars. But the evidence against him is, is so overwhelming. Um, and a judge determined that uh, the the allegations are so serious and the, uh, the, the that there is a threat to, you know, national security were he uh, to be uh, released. So he couldn't be, he was ordered held pre-trial. And that's obviously a little bit of a distinction from, um, you know, the <laughs> The yeah. current uh, for uh, the current leading candidate for the Republican nomination for president, Ryan Riley. Thank you very much for bringing us that developing news. Speaking of what happens to government secrets, we are getting some new details now tonight about a big cyber attack that has hit several government agencies and may, in fact, still be hitting those agencies. Right now, our team is learning that a national cybersecurity official says they're still notifying users who were part of this attack. They think there is no systemic threat to national security. And they've identified the hackers as this, like, criminal ransomware gang, basically. No known connection, they say, to the Russian government. It comes as we're seeing more and more cyber attacks all across the country, from hospitals to law enforcement to schools and universities. Not too long ago, hackers at a private university in Virginia hijacked the school's emergency system. I want to bring in NBC's global security reporter, Dan DeLuce, for more on this. Dan, uh, it, I know you and your team have been reporting this out over the last 60, 90 minutes or so. Bring us up to speed. So there was a press conference, and the cybersecurity agency gave us some headlines there, some of which you alluded to, one of which is that the Department of Energy is one of the agencies that's affected. They believe that that criminal group doesn't have connections to Russia, but we should point out that that group called CLOP is a Russian language, Russian speaking cyber criminal gang. And this is the third attack in three years on the federal government, third cyber attack. In 2020, it was coming from the Russian intelligence agencies. In 2021, it came from Chinese intelligence hackers. So this is a recurring problem. The other yeah. thing we learned uh, this evening is, is that they don't see any evidence of some kind of ransom where uh, incident or event at the moment. We, you, you alluded to this, Dan, but pull on this thread for us, right? Because why does this keep happening, right? There are so many um, cyber attacks that we've seen at, you know, uh, healthcare companies, at schools, et cetera, in places all across the country. Is this just a function of our lives going more online, our data getting more online, and that becoming a more and more appealing target? Basically, yes. This is kind of the new normal. At least that's what yeah. experts will tell you, that there are just an unbelievable number of attempted attacks and intrusions that we don't even hear about most of the time. And the federal government is actually much better protected than a lot of the private sector. But nevertheless, uh, it is it's almost impossible to have a 100 percent proof defense. Having said that, I think Congress will be asking some very tough questions. A huge amount of public money, taxpayers' money is spent on cybersecurity, and these kinds of things aren't supposed to happen. So I think there's still a lot of unanswered questions here, and we still don't know yeah. what, if any, data was stolen here. Dan DeLuce, thank you very much. Appreciate your reporting on this. Take you to Pittsburgh now, where the jury, just in the last hour or so, deliberating in the trial of the Tree of Life synagogue shooter is being dismissed for the day. They'll pick up again tomorrow morning. And federal prosecutors want this message to stick with jurors. That that attacker in that synagogue shooting did not enter that building five years ago to pray or to worship. He came to kill, they say, as they laid out the graphic details from the deadliest attack on Jewish people in our country's history. You had the prosecutors all but begging the jury to remember the 11 people he killed, those faces and names you see here, the people who can't be there to testify on their own behalf, in gut-wrenching closing statements, laying out what happened on that Saturday in 2018. You see, they say he turned the synagogue into a hunting ground. They reminded jurors of his anti-Semitic social media posts, where he laid out in specific detail how he intended to kill Jews. And they say he only stopped because he ran out of ammunition, even shooting at police who arrived on scene. Remember, this shooter faces 63 federal charges, some directly related to hate crimes. He's pleading not guilty in only the second federal death penalty case under the Biden administration. George Solis is live for us outside the federal courthouse in Pittsburgh. So no decision from the jury tonight. Obviously, George, they're home. They'll be back in the morning to continue to deliberate. And the last words they heard, right, from both the prosecutor and defense in closing statements were graphic and incredibly emotional, an emotional day for the victims' families here, too. 
Yeah, that's absolutely right, Hallie. And I spoke with members of the congregation who say it takes a lot for them to come to this courthouse every day and listen to the testimony and remember those lives lost as a result of this shooting. They say that all they can do is really band together and look at the accused shooter. They say they only address him as the shooter because it is just that hard to be in the same room with him. They are hoping justice will prevail. And as you mentioned, the prosecution laying out a pretty uh, intense case here, saying this man intended to go into that synagogue and fire upon the members of the congregation, to fire upon the officers there. He's told officers that he went to kill Jews, that his hate runs deep, and he told the world, I'm going in on those social media platforms. Today, the prosecution saying no one can put this yarmulke back like it was before. No one has mm. the power to do that, but you do have the power to do that with justice. Only justice is a verdict of guilty on every count in the superseding indictment in this case. And so that is where things remain this evening. The jury expected to be back in that courtroom first thing tomorrow to continue deliberations, Hallie. Throughout this trial, the uh, shooter's attorneys haven't denied that he actually killed these 11 people at the synagogue. But explain their defense strategy here. Yeah, that's absolutely right. So no rare cross-examination and no uh, witnesses presented. They're really just trying to build the case around his intent and his motivation, at least in this part of the trial, the so-called guilt phase. So what you heard from the defense is just trying to give a little more character to who the accused shooter is, saying he did things like live in an apartment that was neat and tidy, slept on a mattress floor, had a fascination with computer, an interest in guns. Again, anything to really just explain who this man was beyond just the crime that he committed. But again, as you mentioned, no one here denying that he went into that synagogue and committed this heinous act, Hallie. We, we mentioned how this is a rare death penalty case here uh, on the federal side. But if, it depends on the verdict here in this trial, if it is in fact a guilty verdict on these charges and meets the requirements, there would be another trial on the death penalty piece of it. Do I have that right? That is absolutely right. So we had, again, the so-called guilt phase, and that is what the closing arguments were centered on today. So now the jury yeah. is deliberating. If they come back with a guilty verdict, then this moves into the sentencing phase, which is such a crucial part of this, because this is basically deciding whether or not the accused shooter will get life in prison or will be sentenced to death. And that is causing a bit of discussion here in the community. Of course, you have members of the congregation who say, of course, the crime warrants the punishment. Others saying it would be best for him to, of course, brought in prison, frankly. But of course, that will come down to the jury and the decision uh, as these deliberations continue tomorrow. Hallie. George Solis, thank you very much for being there for us live in Pittsburgh. I am sure we'll talk again relatively soon. Appreciate it. It's exclusive now. Our Richard Engel going one-on-one -on -one with Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky, getting a rare interview right as Ukraine has been launching its long-anticipated counteroffensive. The two talking about Zelensky's pleas for F-16s, the potential threat to a key nuclear power plant. Zelensky calling Russia's Wagner mercenary fighters killers as Ukraine launches that counteroffensive. And he's giving his honest take on Republicans like former President Trump and Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, who are skeptical about giving more aid to Ukraine. Here's what he said about those candidates and politicians. Listen. Is any candidate or senator who thinks it costs too much for the United States to support Ukraine, is he ready to go to war, to fight, to send his kids? Are they ready to die? Richard Engel has more from Kyiv. Here in Kyiv today, I sat down with Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky. It was his first interview since Ukraine went on the offensive, launched a counter-offensive. Since the start of this war, which has been going on for nearly 500 days, Ukraine has been fighting, largely successfully, to defend itself, to defend the capital, to defend the cities, to push back Russian invaders. Now Ukraine is changing that dynamic. It is trying to break through Russian front lines. Russian troops still occupy about 20 percent of this country. And now that Ukraine has more weapons, more weapons systems, more air defense systems that have come in and more are coming in, Ukraine is trying to push those Russians off Ukrainian territory. But going on the offensive is much more difficult than defending your home, defending your land. And although it's still early days, President Zelensky acknowledged that so far it is proving to be a very tough slog. I cannot give you all the details. There are both defensive and offensive actions. Things look not bad. I would say it's generally positive, but it's difficult. 
Zelensky is also telling Richard he's concerned that Russia's next target could be the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, with the goal of trying to pressure Ukraine to get back to the negotiating table on terms Moscow likes. Certainly something we will be watching. And our thanks to Richard Engel for that reporting. More of it tonight on NBC Nightly News, 6.30 Eastern, however you watch your local NBC station. Back here in Washington, a huge victory tonight for the rights of Native American tribes as the Supreme Court is rejecting a challenge to a law that looks to keep Native families together. They're basically saying, yes, these Native families can stay together. It's all about something called the Indian Child Welfare Act. It was passed 45 years ago. Its goal, to keep Native children within tribes in any adoption or custody or foster care cases. It's designed to correct centuries of racism against Native Americans. Three states and a white couple sued the government, saying that that law illegally gave preference to Native families. But in a 7-2 to vote, the justices said, no, these challengers can't sue here. And Justice Amy Coney Barrett, writing for the majority, says Congress is allowed to make laws to keep Native children together. You have advocates for Native American communities celebrating this, including President Biden, who says the decision, in his words, keeps in place a vital protection for tribal sovereignty and Native children. Our Supreme Court reporter Lawrence Hurley joins me now. And this is very significant news. Mm -hmm. Lawrence, explain why. Well, this is a huge win for the tribes because it kind of really reaffirms this protection that they have that you alluded to, which is, you know, the centuries of efforts uh, by the federal government and state governments to take away kids from Native American families in an effort to assimilate them, take them away from the tribe, make them speak English, cut their hair, you know, just distance them from all their traditions. And this was something that Justice Neil Gorsuch really got into in his uh, concurring opinion today, where he was like a kind of history lesson, you know, talking about all these bad things that happened in the past and why it was important for Congress to pass this law and that that overcame some of these concerns that people have that were brought up in these challenges. It is also this decision by the court a kind of surprising one to court experts given that the court has a conservative majority. I think there are those who thought this would go a different way. Yeah, for sure. I mean, even coming out of the oral argument back in November, it really seemed like the court was going to take at least a chunk out of this law. And instead, they turned away all these challenges. They didn't actually rule on the merits in all of these cases, all of these issues, right? So this case could still come back on this challenge as to whether these preferences that the law has are racist because they uh, give Native American tribes preferences over non-Native Americans. So significant ruling today. It is sort of early to mid-June. We know this is crunch time for the Supreme Court. We still have some big cases, big decisions out there on affirmative action, for example, student debt. That's a big one, student loans, LGBTQ plus rights. Talk to us about what we should anticipate and what you're looking for in the next, let's say, three weeks. Yes, yeah, so there's 20 rulings left, and they're all going to come in the next two weeks. Right. Uh, so, yeah, affirmative action is a huge one. You know, what the court did today in turning away this kind of race challenge to the Native American law and what they did last week when they upheld a key part of the Voting Rights Act um, doesn't really tell us anything about what they might do in those yeah, cases. Yeah. Affirmative action, this is a real conservative issue. They've been gunning for that for a long time. So we can't really draw any lessons from these previous cases. Um, the conservative court is still a conservative court and we're probably gonna get some conservative rulings. Lawrence Hurley, thank you so much. I'm sure we'll be talking again sometime in the next couple of weeks. Appreciate yeah. it. Coming up here on the show, we're following some developing news. What we're learning right now about new sexual assault allegations, one allegation against former UFC champ Conor McGregor. Plus, investigators now releasing a brand new report into why that Surfside condo collapsed a couple years ago. Pointing to the pool deck. That's in our five things. And new details tonight about a Chicago woman who went missing for nearly two weeks while traveling in Japan. What her family is saying now. Former UFC champion Conor McGregor tonight denying an allegation he sexually assaulted a woman at the Miami Heat Arena after game four of the NBA Finals. The woman, who has not been identified, was allegedly forced into a men's bathroom by security after the game June 9th, which is where she says McGregor sexually assaulted her. A lawyer for McGregor tells NBC News in a statement that, and I'm quoting here, the allegations are false and that Mr. McGregor will not be intimidated. Danny Savalos is joining us now, our legal analyst. What else do we know about the allegations here and the legal fight ahead? 
The allegations so far reportedly are only contained in a letter that was sent to the McGregor team. So when you say that McGregor has been accused of assault, it's not in the formal court sense that he's been charged either by an indictment or even an arrest. Uh, instead, reportedly, it's a letter that was sent to his team, whoever that may be. Obviously, it made its way to his lawyers. And what's interesting about that is why would somebody send a letter to McGregor and not contact law enforcement? Uh, that either means they have contacted law enforcement, that they are currently working with law enforcement, possibly, uh, or uh, it could mean that they are writing to let McGregor's team know that they're going to be asserting a civil claim against him, perhaps whether or not there is a criminal case opened or not. And at this point, we don't know. They may very well be speaking to law enforcement about this event. Danny Savalos, thank you very much for breaking that down for us tonight as we've gotten that information into our newsroom in just the last little bit. Time now to get the backstory, our behind the scenes look at how a story comes together and how it fits into our bigger picture. And tonight there's a spokesperson for Bill Cosby today responding to a new sexual assault lawsuit being filed against him in Nevada. The attorney saying that the women suing Cosby are motivated by, I'm quoting here, their addiction to massive amounts of media attention and greed. Andrew White going on to say, from this day forward, we will not continue to allow these women to parade various accounts against Mr. Cosby anymore without vetting them in the court of public opinion and inside of the courtroom. Our Kate Snow sat down with six of the women behind the suit for an exclusive conversation you will only see here on NBC News. Listen. Why are you filing suit? To take back my power. It's time for him to be responsible for his actions. Culpability justice. It's never, ever too late to take our lives back and to get the justice every single one of us deserves. And we're living proof of that. These women, along with three others, say Cosby used what they describe as his enormous power, fame and prestige to isolate and assault them between 1979 and 1992. Cosby has consistently denied all allegations of sexual abuse and has no criminal convictions related to them. You'll remember a Pennsylvania Supreme Court threw out a 2018 conviction on assault in 2021. You are looking now, of course, at Kate Snow and a number of Cosby accusers. It's a story Kate knows well. She's been covering it for years, speaking a lot of the times exclusively to these women. Kate, thank you so much for being with us today. It is not easy uh, to, I assume, get in front of a camera and talk about these kinds of things. Um, and yet, many women in many instances have done it with you here. Mm. I think back to one example back in 2018. You spoke with Andrea Konstat. She had said no to every interview request for 13 years and then agreed to one with you. Talk us through what it means to be sort of the tip of the spear on reporting a story like this and how you obtain these interviews. Um, yeah, Hallie, I mean, it goes back years, right? It actually goes yeah. back to the very initial, you know, the early days when we started to hear stories about Bill Cosby and women were coming forward in the press. Um, that summer of 2015, I sat down with 27 women who had come forward with accusations at that point that's against right. Bill Cosby. Um, that's actually not the video you're looking at, but it was a giant, room, one. This, right, yep. giant yep. room full of people. 27 women, which I've never done such a large interview before, by the way. And that was put together not just by me, but a team of Dateline producers. Um, and, and I had to build trust with them. You know, I had to I, st I started out that we, we sat for more than two, three hours, I think, in that interview. Um, again, every one of those women that you're seeing there has made ac accusations against Bill Cosby. Um, and so I started out by trying to tell them who I was and what I've been through in my life and how I could um, hear them and listen to them and let them tell their stories. And so from there, you know, it built a, it built a trust with some of those women, yeah. and I've kept in touch with them. They text me. I text them sometimes when news develops. It's not to say that I'm not still a reporter. I very much am still a reporter. I reach out to Andrew Wyatt, Cosby's spokesperson, who you sure. just quoted. Um, we reach out through and. NBC every time we do one of these stories. And we should note that Cosby at the moment is not convicted of any right. criminal uh, charge because his criminal conviction was overturned, as you mentioned. Um, but yeah, I think I think there's something to building relationships when you're a reporter. Once people know that they can talk to you and trust you to tell their story, the, you know, with just the facts, then they come back to you. And, and with, I think, compassion for what, what they allege that they've been through. There's also been such an evolution in the Cosby sort of story from a yeah. news perspective over the course of Kate, almost the last 10 years, I think, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, it's been a long time. 
It's been a long time. It's actually the early 2000s, if you think about when Andrea Constant yeah. first voiced some of what, you know, or not really publicly voiced, but, but made a complaint. Um, that was the early 2000s. Yeah, so it's been a while. And, and, and these women have gone from, you know, even before the Me Too movement, starting to tell their stories, starting to do group interviews, and then watching Andrea, who you're seeing there, take a criminal case to court once, and, and there was a hung jury, and then the second time there was conviction, mm -hmm. and then it was overturned. And I interviewed them when that all happened, and they felt—many uh, of them said that they felt that justice had been undone. Um, and they, they, a lot of them lost some hope, but then they fought. And where we're at today is that they fought for changes to state laws, Hallie, which is what enabled these women in Nevada, the, the nine women and six of whom I talked to last night. They were able to come forward with this new suit because the statute was changed, in part because they lobbied for the statute to be changed in Nevada. It's also been changed in California, in New York, in other places where Cosby is now facing um, civil litigation. In one case in L.A., he was found civilly liable, by the way. Uh, but Cosby does continue to maintain his innocence and say that he denies every allegation of abuse. Kate Snow, it is incredible reporting. Again, um, thank you so much for helping to pull back the curtain a little bit sure. and show us how this comes together and give our audience a look at that. Thank you. Thank you. We should note, of course, you can see Kate not just on Nightly News, but also from 2 to 4 Eastern on NBC News Daily. You can follow her online at, at TV Kate Snow. Our thanks to her for that. One of golf's biggest tournaments is teeing off today in L.A., the U.S. Open. As we're learning more tonight about the DOJ now investigating that controversial merger between the PGA Tour and Live Golf, according to a source briefed on the matter. The Justice Department had already been looking into whether the PGA broke antitrust rules for keeping players out of their tournaments if they joined Live. Julia Ainsley is joining us now. Julia, um, this is so super interesting. We, we were just talking. We, yeah. Our show has been following this Live Golf saga like since the jump. And now you have this very highly controversial merger, high-profile merger. The Justice Department is getting involved. Why? Because of competition rules? Yeah, it's the antitrust division. They're reviewing it now. They're careful not to say investigation. And Got a it. source briefed on this said that this is actually growing out of that previous investigation that you talked about, that they were looking at PGA to see if they were a monopoly in and of themselves. And now that they're joining with Liv, will it be a global monopoly? Yeah. Will there really be no way to join the competitive world of golf without playing for what this, for this mega whatever is going to be called? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, and to be clear, a review, not necessarily a full investigation, yeah, maybe that's what, semantics, but they're looking into it regardless. That's what we're told at this yeah. time, and it really could put up some significant roadblocks to that merger. In fact, we understand there were already some roadblocks just as they kind of come to terms on specifics. I mean, for the fact that PGA so quickly did this 180 from saying, no, any golfer that goes to live can't come back to PGA to say, well, if you can't beat them, join them. That really took a lot of people by surprise, and now it's actually should come as no surprise that DOJ is throwing up a few red flags over that. And it's not just the Justice Department. There are some members of Congress who want to look into this too, right? Yes. And they are actually naming it for the reason I think the whole public is worried about is the fact that Saudi Arabia is an authoritarian regime. Really, DOJ's involvement has to do with antitrust. But we saw in a letter, I've got it right here in front of me, from the Committee on Finance that they're reaching out to Jay Monahan, the chair of PGA, who's actually on a medical uh, leave for medical reason right now. But they're reaching out to saying, look, we have some concerns because of Saudi Arabia. They're authoritarian regime with a terrible re record on human rights. Of course, we know that they uh, were responsible for the killing of journalist Jamal Khashoggi. They trained some of the 9-11 hijackers. I mean, there's a history here of the U.S. being concerned about Saudi influence, but there's a lot of money uh, at stake here, and it's what brought a lot of these golfers that's over. Right. And so that's what the Committee on Finance is looking at, is how Saudi Arabia could actually pose some national security threat to the U.S. if this merger goes through, even just in terms of real estate. Will they now own real estate next to military bases? That's one of the concerns they raise in their letter. When it comes to the antitrust issues that the Justice Department raises, when you talk with experts in this space, how do they think it's going to go? Like, in other words, is it likely that the PGA live conglomerate, whatever it is it's going to be called, can carry on like without any issues or what do we can we handicap that a little or it's just wait and see i mean i love the handicap term in this no pun intended <laughs> and sometimes in these antitrust investigations just the mere fact that they're looking into it can sour a deal before it comes together people don't want to go through that hurdles at the very extreme of this. We would see them do their merger, come together, and then have a full investigation where they would have to bring this down and bring it to a stop. Uh, so it's going to be interesting to see the level to which they get involved or need to get involved. Yeah, these are all hypothetical.
hypothetical still, if, if, if. Yeah, it's kind of yeah. Silly. It's fascinating, though. And you're a golfer, right? No, not at all. Oh, you're not. Okay. My father you're... played every okay. Sunday of my life. I don't want anything to do with it. Sophia Ainsley, <laughs> thank you so much. I appreciate your reporting on the golf, if not the actual play. I appreciate <laughs> it. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one. Surfside, Florida, is looking at plans to build a new high-rise on the site of that building that collapsed and killed nearly 100 people two years ago. A developer based in Dubai submitted a couple of designs for a 12-story building, luxury building, today. It's coming as federal investigators put out a report saying the design of the pool deck in the original tower was flawed right from the start and had what they describe as a strength deficiency, which put the building at risk. Number two, a huge cyclone making landfall in India and Pakistan today. That means a lot of rain, flash flooding, a lot of wind. Tens of thousands of people have already been evacuated. Part of the scariest thing here, it's supposed to hit the same spot that had historic flooding last summer, flooding that killed more than 1,700 people and forced millions out of their homes. Number three, the governor of Pennsylvania says demolition of that section of I-95 that collapsed should be wrapped up today. So the demo done after that fiery crash over the weekend that snarled traffic for hours. Crews still have to work to fill the gap, pave the roadway so they can reopen these six lanes of traffic while they work on a permanent fix. The governor says there will also be a live stream in case you want to watch the progress and make sure they really are doing what they say they're going to do, which is working nonstop. Number four, a bus carrying more than 40 migrants has arrived in downtown L.A. after a nearly 24-hour-long bus ride from Texas. The Texas governor says their removal was, in his words, much-needed relief for his state. Some of these migrants were kids, and immigration advocates said they were given food, shelter, and legal help in California, with one saying that these kids were exhausted, tired, and traumatized. Number four, a group of big music publishers have just hit Twitter with a big lawsuit. 17 of these companies say Twitter allowed tons of copyright violations by letting people post music with no license. They want upwards of $250 million. Among the plaintiffs, Universal Music Group, which we should note is owned by our parent company, Comcast. When we come back, a lot more to get to, including new warnings tonight about possibly dangerous air, yes, again, in some parts of the country. Why experts say it could be a sign of a new normal. Next. You are about to be looking live at a picture out of Dubuque, Iowa. We want to show it to you. There it is. Can you tell how hazy it is out there? Well, let me tell you, it is hazy out there. The air quality is pretty unhealthy for just about anybody. And if you're thinking, wait a second, this feels like deja vu. Yeah, it is. It just happened literally last week across a lot of the East Coast. Remember these scenes from New York and some other cities, including D.C.? It's unlike what some of us have ever seen before. So... Are these rare climate events something we should get used to? Here's the breakdown. The most recent climate emergency catching New York City off guard. There's no blueprint or playbook for these type of issues. Tons of smoke turning the sky a hazy orange. The air quality more dangerous than it's ever been in New York, forcing people indoors and back in masks outside. So why'd it get so bad? start at the source. Those Canadian wildfires, hundreds of them, fueled by an unusually dry and hot season. Year after year, with climate change, we're seeing more and more intense wildfires, and in places where they don't normally happen. Some climate experts say this smoky scene is a kind of warning sign about unexpected disasters driven by the climate crisis, putting millions at risk. Politicians and emergency planners now have to adapt to our rapidly changing climate. The wildfire smoke on the East Coast was a perfect example of that last week. The White House climate advisor, Ali Zaidi, tells us climate change affects everyone differently, but the bottom line is the same for all of us. If we do not get after the greenhouse gas emissions that drive this problem in the first place, it's going to get worse for everybody, no matter how bad it is right now. This is, unfortunately, the new normal. Natural disasters forced some 3 million Americans to leave their homes last year and cost the country more than $175 billion. This year alone, the West has seen a parade of storms dumping record-setting snow in the California mountains and flooding neighborhoods, usually dealing with drought. Down south, tornado alleys shifting east, with deadlier supercell storms happening more often in states like Alabama, Mississippi, and Tennessee. Our whole community is gone. 
And Puerto Rico just dealt with a record-breaking heat wave with a dangerous heat index of 125 degrees at its peak. When you have a weather pattern setting up in the same areas day after day, you can get these extremes with drought, with fires, with rainfall. And that's one of the biggest things that climate scientists are studying. All of it illustrating how previously rare extreme weather events are happening more often in more places. In this new climate reality, Zadie suggests staying on offense may be the best defense. Everybody has to be in the business of being prepared. It can't just be in these moments of shock when the sky turns orange when we care. We've got to care every single other day of the year. We are just learning in the last hour, New York's governor is warning the smoke from Canada's fires. It is coming back for the state tomorrow. East Coast friends, be ready. Coming up, two Americans have been found dead in their hotel room in Mexico. What we're learning about the investigation happening right now. Plus, hundreds of people still missing after a boat carrying migrants sank near Greece. The latest in the local. The State Department tonight confirming the deaths of two Americans at a resort in Mexico's Baja, California Peninsula. The suspected cause, gas inhalation. This happened in a community near the ocean called El Pescadero. You can see it here. It's just north of Cabo. Paramedics responding to a call that two people were unconscious in their hotel room. By the time they arrived, they say the two were already dead. Mexican officials say the cause of death was intoxication by substance to be dis determined. Here's what the State Department said. We are closely monitoring the investigation into the cause of, the, of death, uh, and we stand ready to provide any consular, uh, uh, any appropriate consular assistance. Dana Griffin is joining us now. Okay, so, Dana, we are hearing now from the family of Abby Lutz. Tell us more about what they're saying and what else we know about what happened. People have said, you know, we're pointing the finger at gas inhalation. Does that mean carbon monoxide? It could be. We are still waiting for toxicology results to confirm exactly what substance. But according to the family, and they even wrote this on their GoFundMe page, they say that they have been told it was due to improper venting of the resort and could be carbon monoxide poisoning. That's, I guess, information that they're getting from officials. Right now, the State Department is not further commenting because of privacy concerns. But they tell us that their loved one, Abby Lutz, the 28-year-old who was there with her 41-year-old boyfriend, John Heathco, were, you know, enjoying a, a great time in Mexico. This was a luxury upscale resort, a place that they felt safe. It was nice, very comfortable. They say they got there on Saturday and they started feeling ill. They actually went to the hospital Sunday night, spent the night, had to get IVs because they thought they had food poisoning. They started feeling better. And on Monday, they went back. They actually enjoyed time at the pool, text their family that they were going to bed. And that was the last time the family heard from them. We spoke to not only the stepdaughter, but um, excuse me, Abby's stepsister and stepmother. Here's what they had to say. She thought it was food poisoning for sure. Um, they had gone to dinner and had some steak and some guacamole and some chips and they just thought it was food poisoning. They had no idea. None of us thought about that, you know, because you can't smell carbon monoxide. Again, that's where the whole carbon monoxide poisoning comes from. Officials are still waiting to confirm if that was in fact the the gas inhalation substance that may have killed them. But Hallie, this isn't the first time Americans have been found dead at resorts or other Mexican um, or hotels that have been connected to suspected uh, carbon monoxide poisoning. Actually, in October, three Americans were found dead at a, a, a rented apartment, and the substance there was some sort of gas, some sort of uh, carbon monoxide. And then in 2018, a gas leak caused by a water heater killed two parents and their young kids, again, suspected of carbon monoxide poisoning. So this is obviously painting a picture of, of concern for people who like to travel because these are places that a lot of people would find comfortable and should be up to scale. But we've been told that in some cases in Mexico, proper gas line installation, vents and monitoring devices are often lacking. So it's definitely a warning to other people that are planning to travel to the country to be safe and make sure you're checking your rooms so that something like this, unfortunately, doesn't happen to anyone else. Hallie? Dana Griffin, live for us on this story. Dana, thank you very much. Appreciate it.
NBC News covers hundreds of international stories every day, and because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our team has done it for you on the foreign desk. Here's some of what they're watching in a new segment we call The Global. Out of Germany, an American man has been arrested for allegedly pushing two U.S. tourists something like 165 feet down a ravine, killing one of them. Police say the man lured these two women to a bridge that looks over this popular castle, big tourist spot, before attacking. Prosecutors say the woman who survived is still in the hospital. Out of Greece, rescuers have been looking for survivors after a boat carrying migrants sank in the Mediterranean. No survivors have been found since early yesterday when 104 people were rescued. At least 79 people are dead, although that number could end up way higher. Officials think the boat was carrying as many as 750 people. Out of Japan, a woman from Chicago who was missing in Japan for nearly two weeks has been found. Her family said... They said she'd been talking with them every day until she suddenly stopped sending messages earlier than this month. Her family says they filed a missing person report and people in both countries were trying to find her. It's not clear where or how she was found. Her sister, the Chicago PD, and the U.S. Embassy in Toko, Tokyo did not immediately respond to a request for comment. Coming up here on the show, some potentially good news for just about any ticket buyer. Why hidden junk fees could be a thing of the past. That's next. Tonight, a pretty big development over at the White House. For people who buy tickets or maybe rent Airbnbs, those so-called junk fees, like those hidden fees that we talk about on stuff from concert tickets to hotel rentals, they raise ticket prices by something like 78%, but they may start to get way more transparent on sites like Ticketmaster, and it could happen soon. We got the president meeting with companies like Live Nation, SeatGeek, Airbnb in just the last few hours. And under pressure from the Biden administration, the president says that those companies have committed to ditching those hidden charges. Listen. The, the solution is what it's called all-in pricing. And uh, that's where companies fully disclose their fees up front when you start shopping. So you're not surprised at the end when you check out. NBC's Noah Pransky has posted up at the big board to break it all down for us. No, I want to be clear here. The, the, it's not as though stuff's going to get cheaper. You're just going to know more quickly what you're actually paying, right? Like, there won't be that kind of, whoa, like, surprise moment when you go to your checkout cart. Yeah, we're going to eliminate the sticker shock here. That's the good news. The other good news is that you'll be able to be a little bit of a smarter shopper, maybe a little more comparison shopping here. But the bad news is that... Ticket fees are still kind of outrageous. You're looking at a Taylor Swift concert next month in Denver. $15.39 for the resale value on those tickets. $462 in fees on top of that. So, yeah, you still might get sticker shock when you see those numbers. But we know that the old way to buy a ticket was you would just pick one from a teaser price, the advertised rate, and then close your eyes and pray that it wasn't more than 20 to 30% more when you got to check out. The new way from these companies that are committing to more transparency is that you will see the total cost up front. That allows you to comparison shop if you choose. And obviously, maybe even this might bring down some of the prices through competition. Now, the gold standard here, tickets not quite uh, to entertainment events where the airline tickets are right now, because airlines, you see a price, you get through the process, you comparison shop, the price you pay at the end is the exact same price you see at the very beginning for at least getting on that plane. We're also talking about Airbnb because they're making a commitment to make more transparent pricing available, too. They aren't quite to where the airlines are, but they did launch a new tool that allows you to see the all-in pricing. So we're moving in the right direction, but the Biden administration says we still want to do more. They have something called the Junk Fee Prevention Act. It's pretty popular, Haley. Uh, it sure is, and it has bipartisan support, right? I mean, looking at it through my Washington lens here, there are folks from both sides of the aisle who support this push to take on hidden fees. Yeah, so, Hallie, the numbers are pretty identical here across the parties when you don't tell them it's a Joe Biden plan. The things in the Junk Fee Prevention Act, it really aims to do a lot. It aims to cut down on subscription cancellation fees, make it easier to cancel your streaming things, uh, obviously cut down a lot of hidden fees. It's very popular across both parties. But the Biden administration just knows it's going to be really hard to get anything through Congress. So instead, they're kind of taking an incremental approach. They're tackling enforcement with the FTC issuing hundreds of millions of dollars of fines to the most egregious offenders. They're trying to scare entire industries one by one into being more consumer friendly. They're also working with states on individual laws in states like California, where they figure if they can ban hidden fees in one state, 
the, all these industries are going to have to fall in line across the country, so all of us could potentially benefit. And they're also working with the FTC on a potential new rule that may not limit what fees can be charged, but at least require all industries to be more transparent. We're talking about uh, food delivery. We're talking everything from funeral homes to airlines. Everything would have to be transparent. So they're really working on these things, and they know the clock is ticking because who knows who's going to be in Congress next year. That is for sure. Noah Pransky, thank you very much. Noah, appreciate you running through all of that for us. Thank you. That's a wrap for this hour and for the one before it. If you missed any of it, catch up on the latest reporting and the newest interviews from our team. You can find us anytime in so many places, including Peacock, Hulu, YouTube. Just search Hallie Jackson now. We will pop up. You can watch, and we'll see you right back here tomorrow. Top Story picks up our coverage with Tom Yamas right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.